Uh, and while we all know at this point Glory's road to get here, his incredible run through the World Championships, really being a bit of an underdog, I think, in terms of the... Uh, the hype that was surrounding Luna and Yala and a lot of the other very strong competitors, he uh, very much eclipsed all of that and uh, did a very, very good job in his run through to the World Championship. But Fury Hunter on the other side is just one of those players that, if nothing else, I respect his uh, tenacity, his uh, attitude to just stick with it, prep at all times, and just commit huge amounts of time to making sure that he is as prepared as possible, which uh, is why it's often so heartbreaking seeing him do not so well in the first rounds of these tournaments. But hopefully, as you are saying, he can turn things around now as we head into our first game of this series. I believe that the spectator may be reversed here. I think that's Fury Hunter uh, on the top as opposed to Glory. Uh, but either way, kicking things off, it's uh, a reasonable full mull from both sides. I think we can agree. It is true. Again, to anybody that might be a bit confused, sorry, we'll get this fixed as soon as possible. But it is Fury Hunter running the two ofs priest and glory on the Highlander priest. So just ignore the camera for now if you prefer. Um, you were mentioning, Derek, that Glory absolutely swept the floor with you in the Highlander Priest mirror. I know it's not quite a mirror of archetypes here, but yeah. uh, could you draw any similarities to how it might play out against uh, the Resurrect Priest? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's for the most part that these Priest decks, you can often get in your head that they are like very slow control decks, that it's all about uh, waiting until your powerful removal spells come down, like Plague of Death or uh, the Soul Mirror as well. But really, even the Resurrect version, it's essentially a tempo deck. You're trying to go about it in different ways. It takes a little bit longer, obviously, with the, uh, the Resurrect version because you have to get all these big minions dead and then resurrect them. But you can't be faffing about with value for too long. You need to get stuff on the board because eventually your opponent's going to have a board that you just can't answer and then you die. Well, given that argument, it's unfortunate for Fury Hunter that he just did not have tempo. He does have a bunch of nine cost spells, which, I mean, I guess this palm reading will give him some nice juicy discounts mm. on the spells, but there is none of the early bone rates that he really wants to see. There is, however, access to Thought Steel to maybe try and pull him some value from Glory's deck instead. It's, I mean, it's classic priest, right? If you can't find something to do with your own deck, you'll find something to do from your opponents instead. Obviously, the powerhouse cards that you can steal uh, in Zephyrus and Dragon Queen Alex Straza will not be active, given that he is playing a two of deck. But there's still just some decent mid-game threats that you can throw down. Maybe Draconic Studies to discover a dragon. Uh, or the best card off the top on turn four instead will be a, a very welcome addition to this hand for glory nonetheless. Yeah, the Vargoth is a play on curve, but is really not getting very much done on this turn, unless you want to try and take a 50-50 to get double insight. I'm not sure if that's worth it, but Fury Hunter is just going to play it for tempo. Like you said, essentially this deck just wants to get minions on the board and resurrect them. He has to play as aggressively as possible, because if Glory has all the time in the world to work with, his deck just packs a lot more punch. That's right. It's the, the beauty of a deck where your strongest combo card in Archmage Vargoth, you can just throw it out onto the board. Like You don't even give a damn about him because he's going to be rezzed with mass res, and then hopefully he'll get you another copy of that plate so you can resurrect six minions on a single turn. For now, eight mana rather than even nine, which uh, of course is exactly what the res priest needed to be doing. And so now for the Highlander priest, which again, Glory is playing on the bottom as soon as we get these cameras fixed uh, the right way around. Does need to be wary of this, of course, because there are some things that Vargoth can do while it's on the board here. But I would say it's not necessarily a minion that you have to kill here, which is why we do see the uh, the Ogre just being dropped down here instead. And I can kind of respect the fact that Vargoth uh, isn't that much less scary when it's dead than alive. All right, we got the cameras fixed, and that makes things a lot less confusing. But the <laughs> thing you mentioned about Vargoth is absolutely spot on. If your opponent is willing to play it down and not immediately get value for it, it's because they're most likely just planning to res it in the future. They want it in the death pool, and playing it onto an empty board means that if it gets stolen, it's not likely to get killed off on the other side immediately. Um, the one thing I suppose that Glory could be sad to see is additional value from Vargoth, so... 
if it is any mm. card generation, such as the other palm reading, then that might be a bit sad, but he's already seen one palm reading. And instead, Glory had just gone for the Ogre Mancer, which is a card that has been quite popular, not just in Highlander Priest. It feels like any deck that has, you know, a bit of a slower game plan and you have an extra slot in there, you can put it in to try and mess with popular decks such as Librem Paladin. That's right, we've had a relationship that, uh, to Ogre Mancer that's kind of like trogs all the Earthenator in reverse. <laughs> we just assumed that Ogre Mancer was garbage, and uh, it turns out it's actually pretty good rather than it being endlessly hyped and then being unplayable in the end. Uh, and it is a little bit annoying here for, uh, for Fury Hunter. He is just, instead of going for the double insight, which is definitely what I was initially looking at on that turn, just coins out another big minion here, which is guaranteeing him stats on the board, mm. which I can certainly respect. It's true. I also wonder how this Illusia that he's already drawn is playing into his overall game plan. I don't quite see it coming down in the uh, next couple turns because Fury Hunter definitely wants to try and get the value off of his insight and thought steal. Um, but it could also be an interesting window, right? While playing Illusia in the middle game means that none of the eight cost cards can be played by glory on the backswing but maybe it doesn't accomplish much overall for now it is a battle of the board and glory is doing his best to clean up what he can and keeping the ogomancer nice and healthy is pretty much always what you want to do with this priest deck as long as it can survive the minion hits on the other side you are essentially guaranteed a pretty decent amount of value uh, and speaking of value thought steal into thought steal the old school infinite value train is uh, just beginning yeah, and not only that, the other card that the Thought Seal pulled was Madame Lazul, which mm -hmm. is potentially getting Fury Hunter even more value. He could hit the Raise Dead in Glory's hand if he wants to play that. Um, it's also just a play on this turn, which is not an additional spell. He is going to, however, trigger the Ogre Mancer soon. I guess it's because he doesn't feel like he's under very much threat. He has Holy Nova to clean up if he wants anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, it's one of the first things that you realize uh, the Ogomancer triggers before the spell is played, so any AoE is going to kill off uh, the extra little resurrected ghoul thing, whatever it may be. Uh, so it's really not all too bad of a situation for Fury Hunter. Again, just building up that value, getting things nice and uh, juiced up for that mass res. The real difficult thing for him is all these minions that he has in hand, he honestly doesn't want to play them because if the, the resurrect part of the deck, he doesn't want these rubbish minions in his death pool. That's true. The Lazul can probably wait until at least after the first mass res. Getting a guarantee on Vargoth is super valuable because you essentially get to double up on your mass res. So he can play Kartut Defender here if he feels he's under threat. But if both of those die on the backswing, it's not guaranteed to get um, the Vargoth back. Well, there's a few ways here for the Glory to try and maximize his tempo. Obviously, the, these uh, Draconic Studies are looking pretty nice to just get him a dragon. Could have even found, like, Mirazond there, which would not be bad at all. But now finding Elusha on the other side is uh -huh. very interesting indeed. All right. It's a great way to start off game one of round one of Swiss <laughs> with Elushas on both sides and an Elusha still in Glory's deck. Um, this looks like a bit of a simpler decision. Unfortunately, all of these dragons are too expensive, even post-discount, to be played with the rest of Glory's mana this turn. But I am pretty interested in just, yeah, maximum value. Oh, yes. I mean, even if they have the uh, the Plague of Death to obviously have the best answer to Plague's Proto-Drake, I guess, appropriately enough, uh, you still just want the biggest threats that you're throwing down turn after turn, as Glory knows full well here. The best defense very often is just a strong offense by playing out all his minions. And we did establish at the beginning of the match that Glory does have the advantage the longer the game stretches out in most cases because he is packing a bit more value. And so Fury Hunter can already go for his first mass rest here to get Vargoth and the first Kartit that died, and then he can double up on that. Um, is there a better mass rest that he could hope to get? Well, currently he's going to be getting the uh, the Kartuts. He's going to have a full board, right, of Kartuts and uh, two Vargoths at the end, which is obviously very impressive. Uh, the obvious downside is you're going straight into turn nine, which could just be straight up Plague of Death on the other side. Uh, but that's always going to be a threat. You know, the longer you wait, the more likely they are to have it. 
So I am fully on board with just going for it now and forcing them to have that removal. I completely agree. Sometimes they don't have the Zephyrus. Sometimes they don't have the Plague of Death. And and it's uh, harder to find answers in a Highlander deck. So Fury Hunter is going for maximum development as soon as possible. If they have it, they have it. And even if they do have the removal, Fury Hunter has access to his other mass res at some point in the future. And it so happens that Glory does not have a convenient answer for all of these minions. So is there some broom play that can get enough done here? I mean, I'm, I, if I'm Glory, I'm thinking, is there any kind of Elusha play, first of all? Obviously, things have been cheapened by a uh, palm readings played earlier on, not to the point where a Plague of Death would be playable, which is obviously the real break point that he's trying to hit here. In which case, I guess you're right. Maybe the broom is the best way to go. You can carge a copy of Carter Defender in order to put up a defensive wall of your own is not terrible at all. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be something along those lines. And honestly, trading here might be more detrimental to glory than advantageous in the long run of things. I, I expect to see no more than uh, a couple cartoons die here. Obviously, you don't want to be trading the top half and leaving the bottom half cartoon yeah. because you essentially give Fury Hunter charge on the first half of its minions. So he is going to leave up, uh, what is it, 16 damage on the other side. Super scary. This is a problem that you're going to be running into more in, uh, in Battlegrounds than Standard at the moment. If my board is not big enough, I need more room for all the things I'm going to be summoning. Because with two copies of Grave Runes in hand now, obviously Fury Hunter can, as you were saying, erect that impenetrable wall. Uh, but again, for Glory, he just needs to steal one of these or find that one Plague of Death or Zephyrus in order to clear. No matter what Fury does here, he knows that it, there is the potential for there to be an answer on the other side, which is where he needs to find this balance of not overextending. I think this is very much enough for Fury Hunter here. If anything, I expect him to just use perhaps this Holy Nova to clear most of what Glory has developed and continue to push for what looks like a two-turn lethal. Indeed, definitely the way it's looking at the moment. Yeah. Holy Nova being the only spell played gets the Vargoth usages as well. I mean, the really interesting thing on the other side is the fact that Glory does currently have a, uh, a six mana Malagos in hand, which could be utilized alongside. Oh. Uh, Zephyrus, you know, I mean, Arcane Explosion here could be used to great effect. Uh, obviously, the problem being uh, there will still be a whole lot of Carter defenders on the other side. And is Zephyrus willing to play along with you? Based on Fury Hunter's camera, I think he feels he messed up quite a bit with all of the extra Holy Novas. I think he yeah. accounted for one extra Vargoth activation, but he had two. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, Glory is back to full health, but essentially in the same problem without a board. So Fury Hunter is still very much in a good spot. He got the important thing done that turn. And this is what I was talking about at the start. The Priest has endless development in terms of threats. Look at all these big juicy minions that Glory can throw down. And yet removal is incredibly scarce here. It looks like he's going for the line I was thinking of here of trying to get uh, an arcane explosion to which Zephyrus decides, okay, I'm gonna play ball on this one. I give you the arcane explosion, which is a big deal. It clears up a lot here, but Fury Hunter, I have to imagine on the other side, is almost thinking, brilliant. I can play some of these cards now and repopulate the board instantly. Yeah, these Grave Ruins are going to get straight to work now, even if he has to trade everything into Malagos because the spell damage recurring can be a little bit scary. He is going to be faced, uh, Glory will be faced with the exact same problem as last turn. His health total is still fine, but he is one answer down to all of these big boards. And while we talked about how some of the development from Fury Hunter can be negated, it's kind of dependent on Glory having been able to find steel effects or silence effects in the early game, which he did not have. That hysteria is kind of interesting because you can get yourself all these attacks to face and then target the Malagos. Uh, in order to get face damage whilst also clearing off the big minion on the other side, whereas it looks instead like he's just going to manually punch in all these cartoons to clear it off, which is perfectly fine as well. It still leaves him with a formidable board indeed. Oh, yes. I definitely like getting the Grave Ruins usage while he guaranteed has a minion on board, because 
after the grave runes, he actually doesn't have that much redevelopment. Ray's dead, potentially for more cartoots, but in terms of mm. big bombs to fill the board, he has used his Mazdrez and the Vargoths have uh, already been played. Glory here picks up a welcome threat, and he can kind of bank some of these dragons if he wants for a big oh. room turn next turn, but the Deathwing is super interesting. Probably doesn't get enough done this turn, so Ysera instead giving him some Druid flashbacks. I mean, this could not have been any better for Glory, really. Those are two mm -hmm. absolutely premium dragons uh, on the other side. The one thing to be afraid of, of course, is that Fury... Glory knows that Fury Hunter has a Mind Render Alusha in hand, which he is then snap playing. He's going to get the kind of bad news that this is not a dragon that you can just throw out on the board willy-nilly. But it's still kind of okay, right? He can send all the card to its face. Uh, sometimes the Deathwing doesn't kill the majority of Glory's threats. It's really tough to do the math on this. Um, Alternatively, he could just broom some things. I yeah, well, the second halves of the card to its. I think what Fury Hunter wants to do here is play spend four mana and then play the second Elusha so that Glory never gets a chance to play with Fury Hunter's hand. Because if he does, he just gets to throw down the Plague of Death. This was right, a yeah. very quick Mind Render Elusha that was thrown down, giving Glory the answer that he has quite clearly been so sorely lacking. Absolutely. And my mind is thoroughly rendered here. I do love the idea of ending with Elusha. And Fury Hunter quickly identifies that he does not have time to be messing about with finding the optimal Deathwing traits. Right. So he just plays them down. He gets the broom done. And he gets to deny Glory's answer, taking his hand right back. And Glory pretty much needs to find Zephyrus, I believe, off of his raise dead. Uh, right, because Zephyrus has died on his side of the board, so we would get it back at, at the end. They're getting confused all this swapping back and forth. But yes, uh -huh. that would be uh, very, very uh, crucial, really, at this point, given that he didn't find a dragon uh, off of the uh, the portal on the draw there. Oh. Okay. Some taunts is delay. I mean, he has seen Fury Hunter's hand. He knows that there's very little aggression in there. Um. Oh, man. This game is already just so interesting to me. The fact that Fury played that Alusha so quickly, I really wonder if he knew that Glory would have picked the Alusha where it presented to him. Was he banking on the fact that that would be there? Or was it just saying it will be good enough whether or not my opponent has the Alusha, whether or not he can do the double flip back and forth? Yeah, I think he was just um, zeroing in on there still being one cheapened dragon. That's pretty good for Elusha and then whatever other cards he can dump from Glory's hand. Great, yeah. but he got the even better news that not only does he get to dump Glory's hand, he gets to protect his own by playing the second Elusha. And Glory is on the back foot here. Inner Fire is pretty interesting, but I'm not seeing a lethal quite yet. Maybe Renews can do something. Yeah, it's obviously very, very difficult with that uh, untargetable minion sitting on the other side. You can't even target it with a hysteria to make it beat itself to death against your own minions. Mm -hmm. Holy Nova is a way to chip some of that damage away, you know, if you did want to get a little bit more uh, damage to face rolling, so I'm perfectly on board with that. Seems good to me. Fury Hunter here, really, the only thing he's afraid of is Glory drawing his one of Plague of Death. Well, I suppose the dragons it, that Glory has shuffled into his deck are quite scary as well, but now that the broom has been consumed as well, um, they don't immediately get to clear Fury Hunter's board. The really interesting thing to me at this point as well is the fact that Fury Hunter has uh, left that insight in his hand unplayed for quite a while. It could have been played on this turn before the Forbidden Words had come down. There were a couple of opportunities I spotted. Uh, do you think he's afraid of fatigue coming into play, which is why he's holding it back? Or is there a more specific minion he's trying to target with it later on? Um, I don't quite see fatigue coming into play, but mm. it could just be that he doesn't feel the need to develop any minions at the moment and just uh, carry on with his plan of eking all the value out of his Karta defenders, healing them back up. Fair enough. 
Okay, okay, again, we're getting pretty close to some lethal damage coming through here, even with the Carter healing. Like, I don't expect to find it uh, on this turn, but with the Holy Nova being able to do quite a lot here to make this more amenable, it's looking rough for Glory. Very much so. I am looking for fancy hysteria plays, and I am not quite identifying them. I wouldn't mind using, say, uh, trading in the one thief, yeah, and then breath of the infinite, and then he can use uh. to heal his guys back up. Very clean. Uh, yeah, I think slight ordering because he could have traded one in, and then healed the. Th 3-1 on if he traded right, in the Reborn right. one first. Uh, so maybe a slight error there, but the, the overall structure of the turn, I think, was uh, pretty much spot on, even if there was a slight blip there. Yeah, he would still end up with the same amount of attack, but less health on the Reborn cartoon. The future is clear. Your demise. Even more value for Fury Hunter. He is not going to run out of threats anytime soon now that he has that second mass res in hand. So he essentially already has the ace in the hole for if Glory draws his second, uh, his one of Plague of Death anytime soon, which it's not even there. Well, that draw of Renew opens up a couple of interesting possibilities. Obviously, there's the play of just target your own face and hope for Plague of Death or Soul Mirror, I suppose. There's the play of going plagued proto trike and just hoping that they can't kill you on the other side. Or we could even have seen a Sethic turn starting there with the Renew as well. Yeah, many different avenues. Glory going for the only play that doesn't involve any random generation. And he, he feels like this play on average is going to be better for him. Very normal mass res here, Fury Hunter knows that if Glory has Plague of Death, it has to be played right now. And Glory's taking the turn here to, taking the time to play Sethic, it looks like first, which as you were saying, pretty much just locks out any chance of going for a Plague of Death because instead he just wants to heal up rather than try and remove all on this turn, which is, uh, you know, not necessarily the, the first instinct I would have had here. Yeah, um, just a simple attack from the Plague Proto Jake puts him to 16, at which point there would still be 16 on Fury Hunter's side of the board. Um, okay, Shadow Madness is a big, big deal here. How does he go about this? That Inner Fire is interesting as well, because he can obviously steal one with Inner Fire and then buff its attack, or maybe he should buff an opposing Kaj's attack so that his Carter would then die yeah. uh, when he attacks it in. Things get very weird here. It's all quite awkward, right? Because if he steals one of the ones that still has Reborn, he has to inner fire the non-Reborn on Fury Hunter's side, which means he still leaves a far one on the other side. So I think it's better to just hold on to the inner fire and clear it this way. Leave the two Reborn ones up. Minimize the amount of attack on Fury Hunter's side of the board. And all in all, this works out surprisingly well, I've got to say, for Glory. I wasn't thinking he'd be able to find a way to heal up quite this much, whilst also keeping a board presence of his own. And I think, uh, you know, now that I see it play out, this was a pretty inspired way to play the turn. Yeah, the Shadow Madness was quite clutch here. I think that gave him not only three extra health off of the healing, it just removed six more damage from Fury Hunter's side of the board. If that were still there, it would be almost lethal, if not already lethal for Glory here. But Fury Hunter still by no means in a bad spot. He has, if he likes, just a way to delay Glory healing back up with the Plague Proto Drake. Ooh, clever combo. I mean, obviously the Wave of Apathy looked fantastic to just deny some healing for a turn, but by going through it this way, he gets to clear it off and only offer what was four healing on that turn, which is much more manageable. It's interesting, though, because then he has to deal with whatever comes off of the Plague Proto Drake. Um, in terms of just completely eliminating Glory's board while minimizing the healing he gets, I quite like this play, but I wonder if there was an opportunity to just, say, drop his own Plague Proto Drake and hmm. go for the wave. Well, he couldn't have played. He had to find the wave. Oh, my bad. Of, yeah. yeah, a uh, palm readings first. But I, I like your instincts. I think going with yeah. Kartut Defender instead of the Hysteria was right. definitely something to look at, uh, because, you know, at one health there, the Plague Proto Drake, Fury Hunter could have just hit lethal if Glory hadn't found an immediate answer. Well, Glory 
by some miracle, has managed to get himself stabilized now. Fury Hunter has used both mass resurrects. He has picked up quite a big value minion off of his copy effects from Glory's hand. But now Glory has the opportunity to just mind control his Plague Proto Drake right back. Yeah, I'm sensing that's probably the way to go. Even with a very tempting Mirazond, the mind control is just too juicy. And if it survives, the possibility of Grave Rune as well would, I mean, essentially just force a, a Plague of Death from Fury Hunter's hand at that point. You wouldn't have much of a choice. Yeah, it's true. I mean, if it's not Plague of Death, Fury Hunter can go for Infiltrator and just delay on the Plague Proto Drake, which I suppose this play means that L Glory doesn't get a full turn of redevelopment on the other side. But uh, I don't know. I feel like um, Fury Hunter is now falling behind. I think he's falling a lot behind. I mean, Cabal Acolyte Grave Rune is obviously absolutely disgusting here. We could argue that it's maybe an over committal because then a single plague of death deletes the majority of value in your hand but at the very least glory is nowhere near dying or even losing the game at this point he knows about the double plagues of death as well from the brief Elusha hand that was stolen uh, right back the same turn so i'm kind of interested in grave ruin and then kill off the infiltrator and he can get the death rattles immediately Instead, going for Galakron, maybe my play was also just extending a bit too much into Plague of Death. So what he's doing here is just developing a single threat per turn. Uh, okay, that's a scary minion on the other side as well. Whoa, one mana soul mirror off the Alabaster? That is, is so illegal. <laughs> absolutely disgusting. Does he have anything to even soul mirror at this point though? Fury Hunter has run dry of threats. And he knows it. Look at that body language. He is running very, very low on threats. It's it, it's the, the point you made that this deck is really meant to just put up an impenetrable wall against tempo and aggro decks that they can never get through rather than have a deck that is necessarily huge minions that deal a lot of damage. And Priest is very, very happily able to weather that storm against all these cartoons. Mm. There is a very ugly clear here, Derek. I didn't want to say it. So I think Fury Hunter is completely within his rights to just pass the turn, try and wait for Glory to develop something else to get more out of his Plague of Death. But the thing is, Glory knows about both Plagues of Death. So I think Glory is very content to just press the button every turn, play minimal threats, and if he just clocks for six every turn, then Fury Hunter will eventually die either from health or to the fatigue, which I thought would not be a big deal a few turns ago, but it could very much come into play. Glory obviously uh, oh no, won't be overdrawing, even with the card gain, so no reason to play anything at all there, as he gets <laughs> another Galakrond <laughs> off the top. I mean, I guess that's a double hero power in a turn if you really wanted to go about it. Uh, the main thing from that draw, though, is that Glory gets information that, okay, Fury Hunter is looking like he may be back in the game now because he can start generating a bit of extra value with the hero power every turn. And uh, maybe if he gets some really nice minions like a Skeletal Dragon, Mirazond, maybe Natalie Selene as well, it's possible for Fury to pull this one back. Right. I'm going to go ahead and use the Hysteria as a single target clear. Make sure the Galakrond gets rid of the Keymaster Alabaster. And this has transformed into a Priest Mirror from two metas ago where it is all about pushing the button. But the big difference is that Fury Hunter is six cards deeper into his deck. His hand is largely just removal, whereas Glory still has Mirazond. And uh, if Glory just carries on, doesn't do anything too fancy, he should be almost 100% guaranteed to win this. Yeah, I, I think it's looking very, very good for Glory as well. Don't let the, uh, the fatigue counters fool you, by the way, as well. It is obviously uh, dragons that are in the deck for... Glory that is beefing up his deck count. So he's a little bit closer in fatigue than you may think uh, to Fury Hunter on the other side. But the point still absolutely stands. It is not looking good for Fury Hunter. And all of a sudden, that keep on the play of insight, while you were saying that uh, you didn't think fatigue would be a concern, and I kind of agreed with you at the time, Fury Hunter seems to know this matchup pretty well. I think he very possibly anticipated that this exact scenario would occur. 
Yeah, I can see that, but at the same time, it definitely feels as though if game plan A of the Resurrect Priest, which is try to build the board and kill them before they find their big Plague of Death, uh, doesn't work out, it feels like their chances of winning in Fatigue are significantly less. Okay, well, did someone say dragons? Because all of them coming in one <laughs> after the other. A pretty unimpressive bunch, to be perfectly honest. This is a little bit below average, I think. But the big daddy in Malagos himself coming through, I think, makes it... Uh, you're more than happy to take this. Yeah, it, at the very least, will demand one of the Plagues of Death from Fury Hunter to be played out next turn. Gonna go ahead and use the Holy Nova, I assume, to be able to push. You'd think so. Could also just re-equip Galakron. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. I mean, he, he wants to do that, I think, when he wants to press the hero power again. And with so many cards in the hand, it's not right. really a possibility right now. Very true. Holy Nova also just gets the more expensive cards, strangely enough, out of hand. Because Galakron is just one mana now. All right, well, he's starting to get some of the good minions here. Uh, Mirazond is fantastic for Fury Hunter, of course. Ooh. The natural Elusha in the deck is a scary prospect because the main thing that you think about Elusha is obviously the ability to play cards from your opponent's hand. But one thing that you have to remember is that by playing Elusha, your deck is drawn from twice on that turn, while your opponent's deck is drawn from no uh, none amount of times. In which case, in the fatigue battles, you have to be very cautious about whether this Elusha is worth playing at all. So I really wouldn't be surprised, actually, if Glory just doesn't really play that for the rest of the game. Yeah, I can definitely see that happening, especially since his hand also, if he just gives it over to Fury Hunter with full mana, it means that Fury Hunter gets to use his Murazond. So if we do get to see Alusha, I don't expect it to happen prior to Glory's Murazon, but it could very well just stay in hand the entire time. Glory is the one who is presenting threats at the moment, but this could be a good Murazon for the Fury Hunter. Begins. Yeah, I was definitely looking at that on the... Uh, Ooh, hello? The other side, but that is not something that you are upset about. Very... Very unlikely, it's got to be said, that that would be the minion to be resurrected at that point. But that's the kind of thing that needs to happen here for Fury Hunter if he's going to be taking the game. Okay, so Glory has two soul mirrors, so <laughs> I don't think he'll feel too sad about parting with one of them. Yeah, one of which costs literally zero at this point, uh, which is just disgusting. What Problem is... The second half of Deathwing. I suppose Shadow or Death on that is fine still. Mm. So he uses the more expensive one, Shadow or Death. He can then Hysteria the second half of the card to it if he wants to push the seven to face. Oh, sorry, the card to it will be both halves of it still. I mean, I think the main thing to take away from this turn is I like that Glory is getting rid of cards from his hand so that he can play the Thought Steal before Fury Hunter runs out of the cards. Because, uh, right. you know, a single decent roll here of another big minion or maybe a key piece of removal uh, could be uh, crucial in making sure that Fury has no chance of pulling this one back. He does have to play something now, and that is absolutely a good playable card. All things considered, it is very difficult to balance the... Oh, that's a very unfortunate outcome for Fury Hunter there. Um, balance the temptation of trying to get max value out of every card because that's what yeah. you're used to in playing in fatigue matchups versus making sure you don't um, leave too little threat on the board and kind of get the rug pulled out from under you here. Uh, Glory, I think... Double Soul Mirror would have been a bit of an overcommittal just to get the 7 to face. He gets a nice compromise here where he still ends up with a lot of threats on the board, has done the card generation, and still has one big removal in hand in case things go awry. And so, I mean, when you say it like that, it sounds uh, reasonable here for Fury Hunter. But do you think, even with these pretty premium minions that he's getting, a lot of the more expensive Priest cards... Are you seeing much of a road to, for victory th uh, for him here? And how is uh, what is his best way to try and achieve that? Um, 
With his hand as it currently stands, I feel like the only major threat at the moment is the Murazon. But Glory, having played, I would assume, tons of Priest Mirrors over the past couple months, mm. um, would know that even if there's no natural Murazon in your opponent's deck list, if they've been Galakron for a while, you need to somewhat keep it in mind. He won't be over committing too many things on the board to get punished by that on the other side. And if there is a Murazon play, Glory will make sure to at least hold on to his Soul Mirror to get, um, make sure he has insurance for it. So I feel that Fury Hunter is just looking for a good window of Murazon to try and get value and board presence, but Glory is not going to give him that window. So this board does not, uh, of course, necessitate a clear on the other side. So Fury does have the turn if he wants it to just develop his own threats here, which he does in the most logical way possible. Just spends all his mana while pressing the hero power. Um, I mean, you know, obviously I'm saying I don't think this is enough for him to win the game. I'm not necessarily offering any productive alternatives for him to go for instead. So I guess this is really his best chance of getting there. Just hope that Glory gets an absolute load of gubbins off the hero power, which for the most part, to be fair, he has. Like a five mana three two there. Uh, Lightwell is pretty much useless as well. It's an extremely slim chance, but it's the kind of things that have to happen for Fury Hunter to potentially eke out that extra value from his opponent. True. Um, the whoa, okay, that is not Gubbins. That is another Elucia. Uh, and the Devout Pupil, which was good even a few turns ago, is now even just better, cheaper. Fury Hunter has the second Plague of Death, but I don't think this board warrants enough of a threat to get rid of that way. So he is going for the mass res here, trying to delay Glory, but Glory has been very slow and methodical about this, never over committing on a singular turn, never walking into Soul Mirror or yeah. uh, Murazon on the other side. One thing I will say as well is that I actually I like that Fury Hunter is going for development here as opposed to removal. Uh, you know, it's very easy to say in these situations that each of his threats is too important to just be thrown down to value traded. But I think he realizes that if he just spends his turn playing uh, Plague of Death and then effectively passing, uh, Glory won't let up for a single turn for the rest of the game. He will spend the entire right. remainder behind on tempo, taking chip damage every turn. And so even though I don't think this is likely to win him the game, anyway to go for this line. Uh, he had the potential to maybe get uh, a Vargoth instead here and resurrect a whole entire board that could have inked him out for a victory. Wings of destruction they come. Hmm. Glory knew that his very last card in the deck was Plague of Death. Wow. And I'm kind of actually surprised to see him spend the whole turn and get one deeper in fatigue just to do this. I, I thought he was honestly just going to maybe develop his own stuff and say, if you're not going to budge, I'm not going to budge and I have more health, so it's fine. Yeah, I mean, I have to be honest, I, I kind of just pretended that the Cleric of Scales didn't exist in his hand because the fact that it draws the card from your deck rather than creating a copy, as you said, puts him a turn further ahead in fatigue also means that he is a little bit behind on tempo here. Of course, he still has no shortage of answers, but that is the one turn I found questionable from Glory this entire game. Yeah, I'm uh, not convinced. But either way, it does mean that he knows that Fury Hunter's main final threat has been eaten through. Fury Hunter on the other side now, though, I think has finally been given a good uh, Mirazond here with two or three, I should say, very impressive minions to just instantly copy from the other side. And this is... Somewhat still navigable for Fury Hunter. I say this with the utmost hesitation, but if that Lazul can pull Elusia, does Elusia even do anything here? Not that much. Like Fury Hunter's hand is better than Glorious at the moment, I think. Yeah, I mean, you just don't want to give. Uh... Yeah, giving the removal of the Plague of Death is very, very awkward. <sighs> Could this just be the Murazon turn? It's a fair amount of development. Uh, the thing is, he knows that there's at least one Elusha in Glory's hand, and he knows that his Plague of Death is cheap enough to be played with Elusha. So if he goes for the development, he knows this board can just get blown up. Yes, and I believe Glory should have the information to know that as well, right? Given that he saw the Plague of Death early on enough to know that they were cheap to eight. 
Correct. Uh, and then another palm reading was played to get it down to seven. Although this is the world champion we're talking about, but this is the hardest level of hand tracking and memory. So the Illusion might not be an instant play, and it's not played immediately. Glory going to go for Soul Mirror instead, still going to get a ton of work done. Doesn't even need the Plague of Death. This is yeah. full clear anyway. More than good enough here. It does mean, though, that as I was saying, Fury Hunter, I think, could not have expected a clear board on the other side for the entire rest of the game. He does now have that. This is the crucial turn where he needs to decide how he uh, best capitalizes on that, uh, that one turn of breathing room that he has. Right, so... Alusha feels like it's actively bad at this point in the game because, again, you're giving your own deck more draws into fatigue by playing that. So it's between Murazond and Mass Res, in my opinion. And the Murazond, given that he knows some of the contents of Glory's hand are just more Alusha's, it's unlikely the Murazond gets him that much value. So he ends up on the Mass Res, gets a decent amount of development, and Glory has a decent turn of at least Murazond Wave of Apathy or Mass Res Wave of Apathy. It's a big threat. And obviously the kind of the the hidden background to what we've all been saying here is that uh Fury Hunter is just on much, much less health. So if this carries on at an even kilter for both of our players, Fury is simply going to die to fatigue quicker than Glory will. That's right. Okay, he can get some very impactful cards off of his own mass res, though. There's a ton of card toots in the pool, uh, in the pool, which can give him a lot of healing. Not sure if it'll be enough, but um, it's something. Going for the guaranteed heal right now off of the lifesteal minion that he steals and the card toot that he generates from Glory. Flesh Giant is a pretty great outcome, but it looks like he's holding on to it because he knows about the Murazon in Glory's hand. Right, and he doesn't think that he can fight back against another 8-8 on the other side. I don't know if I necessarily agree with that because another 8-8 on his side that gets to attack first, I think very possibly would have been more relevant in terms of just connecting face on that turn. And then if he needs to, he can just... Uh, on the way for the Soul Mirror first as well. Yeah, it just gets deleted. Fair enough. I think it's the utility of being able to play a threat the same turn you play Plague of Death, which is very rare and hard to accomplish as Priest is why he held on to the Flesh Giant. So if he wants, this could just be the Plague uh, plus Flesh Giant turn. Ooh, okay, that's a, another illusion that has now been generated. It could be our fifth play of the game if all were to come down. I don't think Fury Hunter ever plays Illusha from this point out, right? Agreed. Because yeah. he knows, well, he's deep, deeper in fatigue, first of all, and he knows Glory's hand is kind of running thin at this point. So it's Glory who can potentially get some use out of these Illusias. Man, that Flesh Shrine is such a big deal here. To be able to swing the tempo, this is the problem, is that it's always been develop or remove. But now, finally, Fury Hunter has the ability to do both here. And Glory now going for the Alusha. Uh, obviously, he now sees that there's another Alusha in his opponent's hand. Does he play that again so that Fury Hunter doesn't have the chance to play with it? But, of course, he wants Fury Hunter's hand. This is right, right, really right. weird. Really quick. I... I cannot tell you how the fatigue works on that if you double Illusia, but I think Glory's more than content just to play a wall here. Fury Hunter is on a two-turn clock. None of the hero powers change that, but Fury Hunter is doing some sort of complex math with the Illusia. Uh, so he knows about the Aeon Reaver on the other side, which allows him to clear the... Um, Devout Pupil, if he likes, but it involves trading as well. What if? Indeed, yeah, it's a bit of a tough one because obviously, like you said, the Aeon Reaver is the real difference maker here, but I just don't think he's going to be able to get through all these taunts in time before he dies, even if he swaps back with Elusha first. 
Like, he can swap back, get his own hand, press the hero power so that even if it's unplayable, uh, Glory would not be able to play it. He gets himself a Devout Pupil, which is absolutely massive in this situation. Swaps the hands again. I'm not even sure who gets what hand at the moment, with that being the third Illusia in two turns being played. Right, but... Everyone's back? Okay, back to normal. This appears to have worked out very, very well for Fury Hunter because he is not giving Glory the good hand, essentially. But Glory is still able to take it in fatigue in the most complex endgame I have ever seen in Hearthstone. Uh, just absolutely ludicrous. And in the end, exact fatigue lethal damage coming through for Fury Hunter. He's giving it that look that every competitive Hearthstone player knows all too well of was there anything I could have done differently over a game that long? Surely there was some edge I missed out on in order to be able to improve his chances. And, you know, we can go back with a fine tooth comb and try and find those one or two places where he could have developed more. Maybe, as you were saying, the insight could have been played more aggressively because he's never winning fatigue anyway. But, I mean, I've got to say, his fatigue endgame there looked actually a lot closer than I thought it would end up being. Right, I definitely have to retract my earlier opinion about thinking that this deck doesn't have what it takes to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against Highlander Priest and Fatigue, but even if your Galakrond arrives a lot later, a lot still depends on the quality of what you get off of that hero power and whether you are able to eke out the maximum value from all of the other cards left in the deck. This end game, Derek, I can't tell you how complex and difficult it is to navigate that on top of the pressure of knowing you're facing the world champion, of knowing you are the first game on stream. But after all is said and done, that's only game one of this series. And this Own is gonna go on much yeah, longer. Indeed, only game one. I get the feeling that maybe some of the other matches uh, being played simultaneously from the rest of the Swiss players might have wrapped up at this point already, or dare I say even most at this point. Uh, but still a very, very impressive win there by Glory. As I was saying, showing fantastic understanding of the, uh, the Highlander Priest overall. I think he knew uh, at all points the perfect level of developing versus removal. He was not uh, scared into going for an overly aggressive removal, instead realizing a little bit of damage coming through, 6, 9, maybe even 12 a turn from all these Kartut defenders. It's still uh, livable. You can get through that and then heal back afterwards, given that you are a priest. And it means that his, uh, I mean, I was going to say most controlly deck, most mid-range deck, I suppose you could say, and the Priest is out of the way. And he's left with the Zoo and the Paladin, two decks that are, I think it's fair to say, a little bit more straightforward to pilot. Yes, definitely. This is going to be all the other way on the end of the spectrum in terms of how Hearthstone games can play out. Glory, I think, has already made a name for himself with his Librum Paladin play because this is a deck that I believe was just one of the stars of the World Championship in his lineup, in Yarla's lineup. It is one of those decks that not every player brought to the top level competition, but I think at the end of it, every player wished they had brought it. And it's one of the premier decks in the current meta on ladder it's been the bane of many people's existence and it's because people have learned how to get the maximum value out of pen flinger which is really the star of this deck and combined with animated broomstick it is more than worth not being able to play all of the pure paladin benefit cards just to have that flexibility that's right i think it's what people quickly realized is that what at first glance appears to be a very uh you know a deck, uh, deck that has very little options in terms of how it approaches things, where you just play the biggest thing each turn and hope that that's enough. There's a lot more intricacy to the deck than the me immediately meets the eye, as you were saying, primarily through infinite pen flingers coming down once your blessing of, uh, once your Librum of Wisdoms cost zero. Uh, the other interesting addition, as you can see there, is actually Crab Rider, that is uh, not necessarily being run in all the Paladin decks, mainly because of the fear of Zephyrus in the early game giving you a hungry crab. Uh, but when it does come down, and if you can hit it with a buff of any kind, it is incredibly powerful and offers you a lot of aggressive potential in the early game. 
Yeah, I think that card added kind of a new uh, breath of ingenuity to this deck, especially when you're able to combine it with Blessing of Wisdom. We can see here that Fury Hunter's version is not running that combo. There's a certain handful of players that are vehemently against Crab Rider. I feel like you either love or hate that card. You can't <laughs> be somewhere in the middle. But instead, he is running the new inclusion of Rally in order to give him a bit more of a value package. It can be really... Um, uh, very beneficial in terms of the card drop package to be able to place Halhead and resurrect Salhead, get even more loot hoarders off of Rally. The card draw never stops, and that can very easily offset what your opponent might be getting in terms of the Blessing of Wisdom package instead. Yeah, that's right. You can very clearly see that Fury Hunter has not just thrown two copies of Rally in the deck. Running the extra copy of Loot Hoarder is very, very important in order to, uh, as you said, get yourself the maximum card draw when you are resurrecting your two drops there. Uh, I suppose the other card that we haven't touched on that, of course, came with uh, the most recent mini expansion uh, race at the Dark Moon Fair is the Librum of Judgment, a card that... Uh, initial glance, I thought would be, uh, you know, potentially game-breaking for this Paladin because of how incredibly powerful we know a 5-3 uh, a lifesteal weapon to be, thanks to Uther of the Ebon Blade back in Knights of the Frozen Throne. Turns out I think it's a little bit more difficult to corrupt than uh, originally I suspected, even with the fact that you can make it cheaper with the Aldor Attendant and Truth Seeker. Uh, but still a very, very welcome in the de uh, addition to the deck, sorry, that still allows for a lot more aggressive potential. It's true. I like how you bring up how it's difficult to corrupt because a lot of the time you don't expect it to cost its full cost because it is a Librum. But um, when you discount that Librum, the card that you often want to corrupt it with also gets discounted. Right. So sometimes um, the math on that gets a little bit weird, but it comes down to because all of the Librums get discounted evenly, you still have to play the Librum of Hope in order to corrupt the uh big lifesteal weapon most of the time. I wonder how these two decks would kind of interact with each other, each other given that the Crab Rider package does give Glory a bit more of an early game edge, I would say, because sometimes Crab Rider, even if you don't get the Blessing of Wisdom on it, if you just stick a hand of a doll on it, can be a powerhouse in the early game. I mean, that's absolutely something to bear in mind, is that we obviously talk about the potential for this deck to go into these late game powerhouse states when you play all your Librum of Wisdoms, you're playing down, uh, you know, these huge minions, pen flingers are flying everywhere. Uh, but one thing that you have to bear in mind is that these can just be curve aggro decks a lot of the time. Uh, if you're able to hit first day at school, Crab Rider, Hand of a Dull, Aldor Attendant, as you were saying, uh, you don't necessarily have the answers to fight back against it, even with uh, Librum of Equality and Lord Barov as two of the most potent board clears in the game right now. Librum of Equality. Wow. We all know which one that is. It's Justice. Uh, justice, sorry, yeah. My apologies. I wish they had just named them after the cards whose effects they take <laughs> after to make everything easier. Librum of plus one, plus one. Indeed. All right. Glory. Fury Hunter, he is able to get the Librum of Wisdom early alongside Aldor Attendant. That is absolutely what you want to see. Although it tends to be that the player going first, I would often give them the advantage, but that's given if they hit the Attendant or first day of school, which Glory has not. <laughs> yeah, and he even mulliganed what you could argue is overly aggressively for it because he had the, uh, the beating heart of the deck already in hand with Aldor Truth Seeker, despite being a five drop. Uh, it's kept almost all the time, it's got to be said, in almost every matchup. And yet here, Glory decided it was not quite quick enough, afraid of the extra tempo that his opponent could throw down at the start. And uh, maybe wisely so, because Fury Hunter here has the juice. Yeah, in a lot of the slower matchups, I'm all for keeping Aldor Truth Seeker. But as we were talking about at the beginning, I don't see this as a particularly slow matchup. Um, it can get there in the late game, but that's predicated on having a toe to toe equality on the board in the first few turns. If you don't have anything played onto the board, one player can very much just run away with it with their early game. So I'm still a fan of Glory's Mulligan. Um, didn't quite work out for him here, and that means that Fury Hunter has full control of how he wants to do these trades. Indeed. And uh, I do like 
as you say with trades, that he is going for uh, the trades uh, rather than just going face every turn because it's not like the, uh, some of the other decks where what you see is what you get with the minions. Uh, you very much have to uh, be afraid of the buffs that can come down on the other side. Not only because the buffs are scary, but also because in Glory's hand, there's the Devout Pupil, another one of the huge tempo swings that can really drastically swing the matchup in the mid game. That's right. As much as it gets tempting in this matchup to be able to push face damage, I feel like every time I leave a minion up on the other side when I could have traded it, I regret it because even if it's not necessarily giving good trades on the other side, if they're able to have a target for Blessing of Wisdom, a target for a single Librum, that can be all the card draw or value engine they need to find the big swing cards like Lord Barov. Indeed. Uh, apologies if you're seeing the same... Uh Slight frame rate issues as I am, but I'm sure it'll be sorted out in a very timely fashion. Already, though, I'm seeing a perfectly respectable play on this turn for Glory of just Salad plus Animated Broom, I suppose, in order to clear off the board. But I think instead he's taking a slightly more... Uh a slightly slower approach, I guess you could say, of going for the classic uh, Blessing of Wisdom on your opponent's minion in order to deny them the attack unless they want to give you an extra card. Yeah, it's kind of like pseudo healing. I like the idea of holding on to the brooms because these are extremely valuable cards in the matchup when it gets to the phase where both players get to play their Librams of Hope. Um, if you're able to, say, answer your opponent's Librum of Hope with your own Librum, which has Rush and assuming you're able to pen fling or even broom away the Divine Shield, you can get so much value off of that. And this is where the matchup does become, in my opinion, a lot more interesting and actually a lot more skill testing is that where you have these kind of matchups, because despite the fact that Fury Hunter had undeniably as close to the best stars that you can have with Attendant into Hand of Adal, it's still looking very even. Glory has not taken a single point of damage. He's able to effectively equalize the board state completely at this point. Uh, and from there on in, Fury Hunter needs to try and find a way to uh, equalize this state. Uh, I will say that this is kind of one of the reasons why I did originally like the play of uh, holding on to the outdoor truth seeker because once you enter this state where things have settled down in the mid uh, the early game, the mid game really really wants to be outdoor truth seeker. It just makes all your plays so much more powerful. It's fair, but I'm still kind of iffy on whether it's actually all that even in this game because Glory just has not had buff spells other than the Blessing of Wisdom. So, like, Devout Pupil still full cost because it didn't even go on a friendly character. He has had just now the first discount on his Librams. The Lady Liadrin and the Penflingers are essentially stranded without spells. But here is the first spell for Glory, first day of school. Mm. However, there's this mage secret that he has to contend with. If the counter spell activates and the Penflingers are naked on the board, that's it for the Penflinger value. And that's absolutely just disaster in this game when you're not able to get the repetitive um, value you off of the flings. That's right. And I think that's why I like uh, his line here of going for what he knows will not be interrupted. He's now ruled out a couple more secrets. Obviously, it was just Mirror Entity on the previous turn, but now we're looking at uh, Flame Warden Ice Barrier as well, having been checked off the list. So he can definitely start to home in on the idea mm. that it's probably Spellbender or Counterspell now. And Spellbender can be quite annoying as well with all mm. of the buff spells here. However, he does have that first day of school. So as soon as he has another spell to potentially be the insurance, should it be counter spell, we could see these Penflingers start getting in on the action. But before that happens, Fury Hunter has a window to try and be more aggressive here. However, he hasn't really hit any minion development. Best he has is the weapon, which he prioritizes developing a 1-1 over. Very interesting. Interesting indeed. I mean, there's a, a kind of a couple of unsaid things about Fury Hunter so far is that one we didn't mention, he got a hungry crab as well off of the uh, the first day of school. Oh, which is yeah. <laughs> a very, very big deal on the matchup, given that I believe it is Glory who's going for the, uh, the crab list, um, which, you know, could be devastating for him later on if he does decide to prioritize the crab rider with the buffs, which you often do, correctly so. Reporting for duty. Yeah. Given that Glory drew the hand of a doll, he did um, go for the pen flinger turn. Now knowing that he can get the flingers back, even if there was counter spell, and he is going to start even pushing this weapon face, which 
is very interesting in terms of how Glory views his place in the matchup. Because we can see from Fury Hunter, he's done the exact opposite of aggression. That Blessing of Wisdom has healed Glory for, what, 16 now? Given the number of attacks that this mm -hmm. Elder Attendant did not give in order to strand Glory's card draw. Glory might be thinking that he is so far behind in terms of card draw that he just wants to try and aggro down. But I'm skeptical about whether that works out in this matchup. Well, there is the crab rider. Things get a little bit interesting now, I suppose. Um, obviously, I think we're more looking at a uh, a clear on this turn from Glory, be it the uh, Librum of Justice or Barov with the mm. Broom, both looking perfectly reasonable by my count. They're reasonable, but it feels super expensive for the state of the game. Broom not even needed to be committed here. Mm -hmm. Um... So Glory's attack to face with the weapon last turn clues me into he feeling like um, that because he hasn't drawn any of the buff Librams, that he doesn't feel mm. like he can get the maximum value out of his pen flingers over time. So it feels like he just wants to go for the maximum minion development instead. He is using the weapon here because he wants to get Librum of Justice down next turn, which will give him more value off of the pen flingers. But he's very quickly running out of things to do, given that the Lady Liadrin will not regenerate that much value for him. Yeah, that's the real problem, isn't it? It's that he doesn't have the, the powerful refill that Liadrin often affords you, whereas Fury Hunter... Uh, I mean, he still does technically have the card draw, but you have to bear in mind that this is still the original minion that has a Blessing of Wisdom played on it. So attacking with this Eldor Attendant is very, very... Uh, something you have to be careful with. You don't just want to be willy-nilly attacking with it every turn. One card draw can be all the difference because the second Glory hits a Librum of Wisdom, he can start getting the Penflinger train down and try to put together the back-to-back -to -back turns of many Penflingers into Lady Ryajin into even more Penflingers. That is true. Uh, I mean, it would have cost one still, so it wouldn't have been playable that many times in a turn. The Truth Seeker does make that a little bit more amenable either way. Yeah. Good draw here for Glory, at least preemptively. Nom nom nom. <laughs> yeah, here it comes. <laughs> Crab Rider hitting the board. I mean, uh, you could argue that it should be saved here for Fury Hunter because there's no buffs on it quite yet. Uh, especially as well. These uh, pretty powerful turns shaping up now with the Liadrin found off the top. Uh, you know, I still stand by the fact that his early game wasn't necessarily dominant, dominant enough to carry him to a victory. But this mid game is certainly looking a lot better for Fury. Yeah, he is really running away with it now. He's the first to get the Blessing of Wisdom for free with the Penflinger train. He develops this weapon, has control of the board, and Glory has already used his Barov. So in terms of delay, he doesn't have that much long left. Aye, aye, aye. I mean, Glory obviously has one big more uh, clear available with the Librum and Penflinger. Uh, I imagine it's not going to be worth it quite here. Probably looking at just Devout Pupil, maybe with Broom as well to get an immediate use of the Divine Shield. But that weapon on the other side is just so devastating. It's really rough, right? Because if he even plays Devout Pupil, it means that Fury is able to kill off his minion that has the Librum on it, which means Fury Hunter gets more usages out of the Pen Flinger. So whether or not Glory develops a minion, there is going to be additional damage from Fury Hunter coming forward. So I honestly feel like this is close to a checkmate position. In terms of what Glory can draw to change that around, it's probably his own Librams, but might be too late for that. I feel like he needs the Librams of Hope to give him board presence first. What I'm about to say might sound a little bit mean, but I really don't mean it in that way. It's that I've kind of missed losing glory. Like, his expression <laughs> when he loses, like, he's just done so much winning over the last few months of competitive Hearthstone, obviously culminating in a World Championship victory. It's, I don't know, it's like seeing an old friend again of when he was down on his luck in uh, Grand Masters a couple of years ago. It did sound very mean, Derek. It wasn't meant to be. It was meant in the nicest way possible, G. He's just been too good for too long. And uh, I don't know, we're seeing a different side of him now. I mean, here's a better way of wording it. I'm happy to see Fury Hunter doing well. 
the first round curse may be finding a way to turn around now. And the Lady Liadja, not for maximum value, but great tempo here. Can fit in three flings if he likes. Yeah, uh, quite right. Seeing Fury Hunter win is like seeing a very, very long lost friend again <laughs> on the flip side. Uh, but yeah, quite right. The Liadra near for two extra card draw effects in the hand of Adels is just backbreaking here for Glory because his entire hand needs there to have been many Librum of Wisdoms played over the course of this game, and yet none have even been drawn at two thirds of the way through his deck. This needs to turn around instantly or the game is over. Fury Hunter taking advantage of the fact that his weapon is just a Pyroblast at the moment. He doesn't need all of the Librams of Wisdom off of Lady Liadrin. He is able to find this window to kill off Glory while he knows that Glory doesn't have many good uses for the Pen Flinger. Elder Attendant far too late at the moment. So the clear is justice, one drops and rush, but Glory says that it's too expensive. It means that I can't come back on the next turn and we have a tied series now. Indeed, it's just the uh, the problem of late game Paladin. It's really like uh, an engine. You need to get all the parts assembled, make sure it's in good working order by getting all your Librams nice and cheap, playing a bunch of Wisdom so that your Pen Flingers can start going over and over. And it was very clear that uh, Fury Hunter was going to go into top gear next turn, whereas uh, Glory was left in the dust. And so heading into game three, we now have, of course, the Priest left on Fury Hunter side and the Paladin left on Glory's side as the kind of similarities between their lineups. The the real difference, of course, comes in the form of this warrior for Fury Hunter as opposed to the zoo for Glory. And uh, I gotta say, against the priest and the warrior, uh, Zoo is a bit of a weird one because it's in a way just a generic aggro deck where it tries to throw down a lot of stuff turn after turn, which could struggle. But it has a little bit more flexibility in how it approaches the matchups than that. It's true. Um, Zoo, I feel, has been in a very weird place for a long time now where. Yes, it is quite powerful in terms of the stats it can put down in the early game, but it often feels like it pales in comparison to some of the ridiculous pace of the other aggro decks in the meta, such as Weapon Rogue, for example. Yeah. But even though Dark Lair has been nerfed, it still can allow you to put down an illegal amount of stats on turn one, turn two. And the fact that Hand of Gul'dan Nightshade Matron is one of the best card draw engine combos in the game means that it still definitely has its place in the meta. I personally, if I were playing in this tournament, would not even have thought about Sue, but if we have the current world champion bringing it, it definitely has some potential in there. I agree. I mean, it's uh, in overall, I would say it's weaker than the stealth aggro rogue that we currently have access to as the premier aggro deck. But it kind of functions with a couple of other strengths versus weaknesses. It's much less susceptible to uh, weapon removal. Obviously, it's a warlock. There's no weapons in the deck. Uh, and it's a little bit less susceptible to healing on the other side because it doesn't rely purely on burn. But it, just in terms of removal or your opponent dominating the board, if you lose board as Zoo, it's very, very difficult to start pulling those games back, which is why, again, Priest, which has a lot of early game development, and even Warrior uh, nowadays, they have a decent way to get pressure on the board, depending on which version they're playing. Uh, it could be a bit of a tough one for Glory, but like you said, those Matron plus Hand of Gul'dan games are nigh on unbeatable for your opponent. Uh, not sure if the Zoo is going to be the deck that is piloted first of all for Glory, uh, but it's the only one we haven't seen from him, and it's the only one we haven't seen from uh, Fury is the Warrior, because it's just been two mirrors up until this point. So at least to know that we're guaranteed to have something other than a class mirror now. It is true, but while we haven't seen Bomb Warrior from Fury Hunter currently, it's an archetype that we've seen time and time again in GM, in the Masters Tour, and despite there being so many different other archetypes of Warrior that are viable, that come out of the woodwork and have new tweaks to them every so often, it feels like there's a certain contingent of players that stick to their guns and play this deck, which is admittedly a lot simpler than the other Warrior decks, but also can just be more consistent in the fact that your game plan every single game is very similar. You get the weapon, you hit him in the face, try to get Blast Master Boom, and that's made even more consistent by cutting class. 
Well, despite the fact that obviously the the, uh, the joke is that Q order does not matter at all. Uh, well, I guess that's not the joke. That's the reality. The joke is that it does matter. But either way, the, <laughs> in conquest here, in not having any effect, they're just going to deny us for that little bit longer. Instead, going with the priest and the paladin once again. And while I've seen uh, the Highlander priest up against paladin quite a lot recently, I haven't seen quite so much of the res priest up against the paladin, which is, uh, I think, quite a lot more of an interesting matchup, uh, especially with what looks like a very premium starting hand from Fury Hunter. It's true. I also haven't seen this matchup very much, but just kind of thinking about how the mid game would most likely interact, it feels like Paladin would run out of answers for the large taunts that the Priest puts up in the mid game. And once the Master has come down, well, you only run one Barov and two of the Librum of Justice, and those only deal with one half of the reborn minions. So it definitely feels like Glory needs to get a strong early game going. Not quite the hand of Adal follow up that he was looking for, but at least the Librum discounts are starting. Yeah, it's it's something. And it means that a lot of draws off the top are looking very good. Obviously, Salat's Pride, Loot Hoarder, Hand of Adal, even just a Librum of Wisdom, just have something to play with the hero power would be very, very welcome. Uh, but I mean, uh, even on the other side, Fury Hunter has not kept what I thought looked like a very premium hand on the other side, which is uh, rather striking. All things considered, though, he has a good curve after this turn of Coin Bone Wraith into Psycho Pump, should the Bone Wraith be cleared. Uh, Glory might not necessarily go for the clear on it if it gets played, because he could be thinking about the follow-up of Psycho Pump. So alternatively, Fury Hunter, if he wants to save the coin for, say, carted into carted, could just take a chill turn. And so Hysteria what he sometimes is a full clear? 50-50? Right. I mean, mm. even just Breath of the Infinite here, I really don't hate the idea of just because honestly it's not that good of a card in the matchup most of the time generally you're facing slightly bigger threats later on it's uh reasonable to clear off divine shields i suppose of librum of hope and devout pupil uh but uh, i would be open to a few different ways of playing this one true i mean i would have even heard the argument for skip altogether deny yeah. glory the draw from salad's pride because you can see here that of course fury hunter doesn't know this but had there not been the draw of the salad's pride glory's turn uh, could have been just hero power. Man, it is crazy how long these draw chains are in Paladin. Like, that one rippling effect of drawing Salat's Pride on three has changed Glory's entire game. It drew him another Salat's Pride, which is going to draw him a Loot Hoarder, which is going to draw him another card. Everything becomes unlocked because of that one critical draw on turn three. And uh, what was looking like uh, pretty much a free win for Fury Hunter at the start is all of a sudden turned completely on its head. Hand of a doll for this value trade is looking pretty Oof. juicy as well. He can fit in a couple pen flings, uh, but they're not going to be able to clear the second half of the Bone Wraith because of the order that Let you need to go for the think. trades. Yeah, I guess the thing that he'll be thinking of, even though, as you uh, correctly say, that does look like the most obvious play, whether or not you let the Salat's Pride die on purpose on this turn, just so that you can guarantee yourself the extra card draw, in the end, thinks he has enough stuff to do on this turn anyway, which I think is probably correct with things considered. So while at first glance it looks like Glory missed one damage to face of Penflinger, he of course didn't know what he was going to draw off of Hand of a Doll, so he was saying that the flexibility is more valuable to him than one to face which is very reasonable indeed. I still think Fury Hunter's in a good spot, though, because he has um, quite a few walls. And for this turn, he feels that the Crab Rider is a bit too much of a threat to just play down the carton, so he's going to clear up. Fury Hunter saying not good enough on the... Uh, Bone Wraith being rezzed there, which makes sense. You know, it would have been cleared off very easily by uh, the single Salat's Pride for the most part there. Uh, and saving it for slightly juicier plays with what you'd have to imagine is going to be Kartu, Kartu, Coin Mass uh, mass Res, or even just Kartu, Coin Mass Res, depending on how things shake out. It's uh, a formidable board for Glory to try and eat through in the next few turns. True. And while Glory can start getting value off of these Pen Flingers, this is not 
um, like the other matchups where this incremental damage accrues into getting you lethal in the late game. Because Fury Hunter has access to so much heal between True. the Kartut defenders and the Resurrects on them. So if Glory goes for the regular game plan of just trying to fling away, I think he will get outpaced by the board presence from Fury Hunter soon. So draws like these will be quite important. Librum of hope in the near future. That's right, and uh, draws that will be very important on the other side, though, is the Elusha for Fury Hunter. That is a crucial draw in this matchup. It's one of the reasons why Highlander Priest feels like it's in such a winnable position against this Paladin, because you can just play it and steal both pen, pen flingers. Even if you do nothing else, that on its own is often enough to secure your late game. And uh, given the Fury Hunter knows for a fact now that there is at least one pen flinger in hand, very likely two, uh, given all the Salix prize that have come down uh, that's gonna be uh, it's gonna have to be correctly timed but still a very very powerful play when it comes down you can see from Glory's play on that previous turn there was an option to use pen flingers and the loot hoarder trade and more um, uses off of the blessing of wisdom to eke out value but instead he goes for the aggressive broom usage with a devout pupil even if it's a bit expensive at the moment because he wants to push this face damage mm -hmm. He knows that the late game will get iffy for him, so he's trying to stick to this board. Maybe hope that Fury Hunter doesn't have enough good answers, but even just a Psycho Pomp here is quite powerful for Fury Hunter alongside uh, Holy Nova. Right, and so you obviously have the 50-50 the on getting the good one, mm. I suppose, in Carter Defender. But either way, I suppose it would answer this board fairly well, uh, given what would be left on the other side. Ooh, all right, going for board presence right now is Fury Hunter. And all of these minions are sticky, so if it's just plain old Librum of Justice, it's not necessarily the cleanest clear for glory. Okay, pickup of another spell now means that the Penflingers can be used safely post Librum of Justice, so that's something. I wonder how much of a consideration Alusha was as well for Fury Hunter on mm. his previous turn, because by coining out his biggest threat, it denies Glory the ability to play it when he does go for Minor under Alusha on the other side. Um, but yeah, there's uh, definitely been a lot of room for creativity in this matchup for Fury Hunter so far as to how he wanted to space out his threats. Now, of course, he has the full 100% information, two pen flingers on the other side. And how he approaches that is going to be very important. Right. Um, this hand of a doll, I can see going on one of the recruits, maybe, so it can value trade over the Bone Wraith. There's still essentially four minions he needs to get through, so all the recruits and his weapon will be clearing the way for the devout pupil to make it to the face. I'm just going with full value trade instead. I see, okay. Well, this does mean now that Fury Hunter has potentially, if he wanted to go for it, access to just like Holy Nova Mind Render and then just play both pen flingers. Not necessarily what you want to go for quite yet, given that you are giving your opponent some reasonable plays on the following turn with a uh, uh, Kartut Defender. But it's already a possibility, is what I'm trying to illustrate here, in terms of denying a lot of extra value from Glory. So the timing gets kind of confusing because you can greet it and say, oh, I want to wait for their Librams to get even more discounted, but then the longer the wait, the higher the possibility that they play at least one of those. If it's post Lady Liadrin turn, sometimes Glory just plays all of the cheap mm. Librams right away, so he doesn't necessarily get to dump those with Elucia. So I don't mind the idea of just going for Holy Nova Elucia now. Uh, alternatively, Holy Nova Psycho Pump still seems quite strong. Okay, just going with the tempo play instead. This is very reasonable. You know, this this is kind of the, the baseline play. Anything I was suggesting with Illusion was kind of getting already a little bit fancy. But something to consider for sure at any point from here on in. Now, obviously, Glory needs to be thinking, right, what is the biggest threat that I can throw down on the board every single turn from here on in. Uh, especially given that these Librum of Hopes can just be returned to hand with the Liadrin uh, that's ready to go at any point. Speaking of Librum of Hope, I like the idea of that healing the Devout Pupil here. Um, he can go for Penflinger on the 3-1, bounce it back with the Librum of Hope and full clear. Uh, I'm not sure what he plans to do with his last mana now, though. 
Rush? Oh, yeah. Okay. Seems like a pretty expensive use of the broom to me. Yeah, it does, especially with Barov in hand, right? I think Penflinger could have right. done a similar enough effect there. I think it was straight up better, unless he is trying to get rid of minions for Illusia, but I think yeah. Glory's reaction says that he was not happy with how that turn played out. And as for Fury Hunter, um, like you said, the information of the Flingers is still there, but it's probably not going to be this turn. That, okay, I'm just wrong. I was thinking this is the turn where the 8-8 probably warrants more right. attention than denying the Pen Flingers, but he gets the barrel, so no harm, no foul, I guess. <laughs> that is and absolutely This is so weird. I see a broom come down. I feel like they don't have barrel. <laughs> Okay, correct order on the pen flingers here, which you have to imagine he's going to be playing. You do not want to bounce these back to the hand right. uh, on the following turn. It means that not only has he gutted the late game potential that can come down with uh, these pen flingers, he's also denied a critical piece of removal in Lord Barov as well. This is backbreaking potentially for Glory, even factoring in that he can go for, you know, Kartut Bone Wraith, whatever it is to develop tempo on this turn. Right. And it might even just be Holy Nova because he doesn't want to give Fury Hunter both Penflingers back with a spell in hand. Holy Nova with Carta Defender. Can he fit in Palm Reading? You probably just end up giving Fury Hunter an additional spell. So. Yeah. I mean, given that it's Paladin, like you have a reasonable chance of just getting a secret, right? And then you can just throw that down as well, I guess, is something to consider. Okay. So, looks like he will go for it. There's yeah. your... The twin spell, though. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of a secret. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, and then he goes Holy Nova Bone Wraith. Or yeah, Aerial Works too. It's just whether he thinks the Holy Nova is more valuable to Fury Hunter or the Hysteria. And... Oh! I oh, wait, yeah. didn't realize this had wisdom on it. That's a great spot from Glory. I completely forgot about that. And I guess a bit of a blunder from Fury Hunter, actually, because he knew that he was giving a Hysteria, right? So he should have just precast the l Blessing of Wisdom on an opposing minion. I've got to be honest, I quite clearly did not spot that as well at the time. Oh. But it's actually a pretty brutal blunder there from Fury. Yeah, it's a big deal because Fury Hunter, by playing Elusha, you essentially give up that your opponent will delete a couple of your resources in hand. Um, thankfully for Fury Hunter, he still has quite a lot of minion development, but the fact that Glory has a few more draws deeper in his deck, even though he doesn't have the recurring value of Penflinger, a threat chain is a very real problem for Fury Hunter here between yep. the second of Librem of Hope and the Lady Leandrin. This is going to be a real close one. I'm already sensing it. There are so many good draws for Fury Hunter. That's what you have to bear in mind. There's uh, Plague of Death, Soul Mirrors, Mass Resurrections, even Galakron. Just to clear off potentially one big minion uh, could be very important as well. But the draws come so slowly for Priest at this point in the game. Resurrect Priest, I think the eternal criticism of it is that it just doesn't have enough card draw. It relies on the minions getting double value to just take up the majority of your turn. But this could be the turning point for Glory. A risky skipper with Librem of Justice, kinda illegal. It's pretty gross. He doesn't get to sneak in that much damage, I suppose, but it does just very easily deal, deal with a wall that Fury Hunter was kind of relying on, uh, to be honest. It was a pretty big deal to keep that in play. I'm not going to knock the Reliquary of Souls either. That could be quite handy later on True. when Glory is running out of threats. Um, for the next two turns at least, though, he has effective things to do. Well. Okay, Nova Vargoth is fun, but instead it gets yogged. Right. And because it costs two mana, it goes to a two mana spell <laughs> and a essentially completely useless one at that. Correct. Um... I guess he just ends up playing it with the Cartet Defender now. Uh, sh sure. If you play Vargoth here, does it cast Holy Nova or the Witch's Brew? Like, did did, I, um, did your hero actually play the Witch's Brew or did Oh My Yog play the Witch's Brew? Things get really weird when you start factoring that in. 
Yeah, that is a, an at Celestalon right there, but <laughs> I guess it would be, um, which is Brew. Sure. But I've been known to be very wrong about some of these things. Okay, jamming the Reliquary of Souls in there, so there's a chance to immediately shuffle off of the Death Rattle. Pain and suffering you. At this point, I've lost count of how many buff spells Glory has played, but I definitely like the idea of going Librem of Hope before Lady Liadrin, so he can get that back into the pool as well. Agreed. Yeah, he, he's looking for every threat he can get at this point. And, uh, you know, the 1-3 dying there, clearly he's happy with that happening or he wouldn't have played it down. Uh, and it does, yeah, get him a little bit of extra fatigue, uh, pushes it away a little bit further before that's something to be afraid of. Mass res now off the top is... That's an interesting conundrum here because obviously it's a good play that you can just throw down on this turn, but getting Vargoth in the pool in this turn, is that worth the chance to have a double mass res next turn? I don't think he's ever dying this turn, so... Hmm. I don't mind it. At this point, it doesn't feel like Vargoth is going to be played with a spell on the same turn to get immediate value. Yeah. So the best you can hope for is for it to res itself off of mass res. The other thing to bear in mind is... Oh no, it just dies on board, right? If you go card to Vargoth with all the trades, it would just about be a, uh, a full clear. Oh, the pen flinger in the pool. Yikes. Betraying Fury Hunter. Oh man. So I think we're definitely looking at a Librum of Hope on this turn. It's, it's, I think, become pretty clear that there's not a big, big piece of removal from Fury Hunter. And even if there is, you're going to get it back on the following turn anyway. As long as he gets rid of the Infiltrator before the Librum, I'm on board. So it's kind of tough to optimize your odds of getting a small minion to die, but I feel like yeah. he can fit in hero power this turn and also a secret keeper, I suppose. And then do some of those value trades. Here he's fitting in a free Librum because it's just one more spell in the pool of the Adrian. Why wow, it's not slowing down on the card draw. Like, uh, obviously you're not going to win in fatigue, but by slowing down on the card draw, you at least give yourself maybe a little bit more time to find those extra threats. Uh, I guess the other side of the coin being the slower you go, the more cards your opponent draws, uh, which gets them closer to their big removals as well. Right. All things considered, a very complicated term navigated well for Glory. I'd argue that Secret Creeper should come down before you kill the Convincing Infiltrator, mm -hmm. but it's a very minor deal. Uh, okay, that's got himself a uh, pretty sizable threat there. Uh, I guess you're going with Kartu over Vargoth here. Like, the the potential of Grave Rune just going wrong is too scary. I wonder. I agree. And he needs all of these taunt threats, I would say, from the Kartu. Yeah. Oh! So is this just no Grave Rune at all then? Sure. This is interesting. That is interesting indeed. Uh, I mean, I suppose it makes sense because the one thing he's waiting for that he needs to win this game is one of the big pieces of removal. Uh, right, okay. Obviously, most likely he's hoping for Plague of Death, but Soul Mirror potentially could be enough here depending on that how that Divine Shield shakes out. And then he wants to make sure that he has extra refill after that. So I, I can appreciate the game plan here, basically saying if Plague of Death isn't in my next two cards, I'm losing the game anyway. And he finds it off the top, rewarded for his line of play here, meaning that after Glory does whatever he does on the following turn, Fury can erect the wall of Kartut Defenders. Right. Good spot there, Derek. I was confused about the order, but now that it plays out like this, I think Fury Hunter was indeed playing to that out of that exact top deck. If the Plague of Death came even one turn later, it meant that Fury Hunter would have to Grave Rune first and then yeah. most likely blow up his own board and be left with no threats. But now, uh, Glory still has quite a bit of substance, but it might not be enough to stand up to all of these cartoons.
Well, annoying as that 6A is, it's not going anywhere. So if you're going to develop, you basically better develop now, I think it's fair to say. Another soul to Am I alone in finding it strange that it was not the cart targeted by Grave Runes here? You are not alone. I'm wondering what you're searching <laughs> for that could have been better than that. Like, uh, you know, obviously it allows for a nice VT, but so does anything that he got there, really. He, I guess, like how we had our mutual moment of silence of why Psycho Pump? No, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, obviously he wants to save it. So he takes more damage and then heals back up. But with this way, he kind of just loses the Grave Rune anyway. It's, uh, you know, it's not a good position no matter what, uh, no matter how you slice it. Lady Liadrin now is soloing, essentially, Glory's value for the rest of the game. He has both of the Librams of Hope still able to be played. Deep in fatigue, but it's going to be a long, long time before Fury Hunter can wait that out. And it would still involve him, I believe, drawing the second Plague of Death sooner rather than later. Yeah, that's right. That's the one thing that Glory needs to be afraid of here is just uh, with Lucia gone, no way to res it back to hand uh, with Ray's dead. Uh, it's just the Plague of Death and not over committing into that that he needs to be afraid of, which he, he is perfectly doing here uh, by what? holding back on the Librams. Okay, this is the crossroads for Fury Hunter, because Plague of Death obviously is going to save him a whole lot of health, but how does he deal with what he knows is back-to-back -back Librum of Hope next turn? I guess he crosses that bridge when he gets there, because this is far too much damage to deal with this turn. That is a spicy final card as well, to go along with these Librum of Hopes. Like, at this point... Both Plague of Deaths have gone. There is a soul mirror left as the uh, the soul strong piece of removal, I suppose. Uh, so how does he play around that? Going for double Librum of Hope, in a way, is not that susceptible because Divine Shields. Obviously, it's not going to clear, but it will summon two 8-8 taunts for his opponent, which is a little scary. It is, but I think this is Glory's only window to close out the game now. If he doesn't go for it here, he's losing to soul mirror the next turn anyway if that is the remaining card for Fury Hunter. It is, however, not. Uh, Fury Hunter has ways of delaying. Um, this 1-1 one -one rec recruit is a lot more valuable than it looks at first glance, because mm. after it gets hit with Librams of Wisdom, can yeah. allow Glory more um, flexibility with how he trades. I'm not exactly sure why he played his turn in that order. He could have just had a lifesteal version instead of a non-lifesteal version if he played the Librams of Hope first. Um, which well, obviously... I didn't realize he just yeah, I mean, didn't bother corrupting it. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't make a big difference, most likely, but it is kind of just wrong, which I wasn't really expecting uh, to be seeing from Glory. No, absolutely. Reporting for duty. Okay, so 50-50 for something relevant to die. Well, yeah, 50-50 at lethal if he wants to take it. It would mean drawing an extra card with the Hand of Adal, obviously to buff the 1-1 one, one up high enough. Uh, right. But if it gets through, he can just go for a 50-50 for lethal. Mm. Yeah, it gets quite scary, right? Because if he misses, he's a bit deeper in fatigue. So Glory takes the more conservative approach, gets the bad outcome, unfortunately, but still gets to push quite a bit of damage. Yeah, it doesn't fancy taking the extra chance here. Um, I would rather just have the biggest board, because obviously there's the threat of Kartoots coming down, more heal on the other side, and whatever happens, it needs to be a very impressive oh. play, and it's the Soul Mirror oh, off the top goodness. here for Fury Hunter. That top deck has just closed out this game, as far as I am concerned. Uh, I mean, he can make a big guy on this turn with four Librams. He can make a 5-5. Five -five and bring Fury Hunter down to four health. But maybe that's just not enough. Because the problem is it's a singular guy that he can make, right? And Fury Hunter is essentially playing two minions next turn with a cartoon. 
Right. And those minions heal him, so... Oh. Like, as long as Fury Hunter draws another minion after this turn, Glory simply cannot outpace him. That was such an interesting final turn, because Glory obviously, as I said, could have just taken the 50-50 for the game. If it goes wrong, it's pretty heartbreaking. But instead, he took what was, I guess, a 6 out of 7 to win the game, unless I'm seeing anything particularly worse. I guess a Grave Rune plus a Car 2 could have gone wrong. But in the end, man, that has got to be absolutely soul-crushing for Glory to take that loss there. That was potentially a win on the table that he chose not to take because he thought he had better than 50% chance to win the game. And whether or not his chance was correct, it did not work out in this instance. So brutal. Another tough end game situation to navigate, not so much in terms of the hard math of how the fatigue and Lucia plays out. I feel that if you had a pen and paper and enough time, you could math out the correct ways to play Lucia turns if you had all the information. With this type of play, there's a lot of odds that you kind of need to finagle with. And whether or not Soul Mirror was the only card that Glory thought he lost to, you could make an argument for either play. Um, what I will say, though, is that in the middle of that game, Glory had some objective mistakes that he really got yep. down on himself for, like the use of Broom over Penflinger, which could have cost him in the late game. Um, it went a lot back and forth there. I thought that Glory was almost nearly out of it after Fury Hunter um, denied him both the Penflingers, but the Lady Liadrin gave him so much value. And in the end, it was that Soul Mirror that closed everything out. We are going to game number four. Yeah, just overall, a couple of uncharacteristically sloppy plays uh, from both players. Uh, whether or not they would have had a big difference in the end is obviously a lot more debatable, but it's just not what you expect to see from two players that I respect greatly, each in their own right. Obviously, Glory, as we've been saying time and again, being the world champion, the current uh, world champion, uh, he's proven himself very much so at this point. Fury Hunter, it's been a long while since he's had that big tournament victory way back to the Dreamhack days uh, in the tour stops in our previous Hearthstone competitive system that I remember him getting the, the big W in that event. But still, I think a player who grinds away every single Masters Tour, always at the top of ladder, always coming up with some of the most creative strategies, and now one game away from dethroning, uh, at least in terms of one series, not becoming the world champion, but beating the world champion in a series of Hearthstone would still be uh, I think a very nice way to start getting his uh, wins back on track. No, Darf, that's absolutely how this works. If he beats Fury <laughs> this turn, Fury Hunter is temporary world champion, and that title gets transferred to if anybody is able to beat Fury Hunter in the next round of Swiss, because even though so much has already happened, this is still just the very first series of the day, and Fury Hunter only has his Bomb Warrior left to win with. After all of these complicated interactions in those past few games, Darak, somehow seeing the simplicity of Bomb Warrior is kind of refreshing. Indeed, after an hour and a half of just Priest and Paladin, pretty brutal games that have been very mentally taxing, we are down to the good old Bomb Warrior. But it's uh, an interesting build, something that has been going on back and forth, back and forth, ever since uh, Risky Skipper made its way through to uh, dominance in Hearthstone. Most Warrior lists have been an auto-include Risky Skipper Armorsmith Battle Rage deck, whereas Fury Hunter has gone with what has proven to be, for the most part, fairly unfashionable, which is the non Risky Skipper version of Bomb Warrior, which uh, I think in the previous Masters Tour turned out to be a bit of a misstep, but here it does carry some pretty big advantages, to be fair. Yeah, I can definitely see that, especially lending itself to a ban rogue strategy that Fury Hunter is going for. Of course, it's not necessarily the stealth rogue that he's chosen to get rid of from Glory's lineup, but still a deck that has a similar operation in terms of small minions and trying to capitalize on boost from Nitro Boost Poison, which is the type of deck that you run Risky Skipper to counter. So Fury Hunter with this Bomb Warrior with a little bit more of the um, weapon buffing package in it yep. with the upgrades maybe has a bit more of an advantage against Glory's remaining decks here. I will say though that I'm still kind of a fan of Paladin going up against um, Warriors in general because if they're able to land buffs on a singular minion, it's traditionally been a little bit problematic for Warrior to deal with. Agreed. I think that uh, Glory is definitely starting off with his better matchup, uh, first of all here. It's the, the fact that this Warrior... Uh, 
I would say that in the early game, it's not actu uh, actually necessarily weaker than the Risky Skipper would version would be against Paladin specifically, because a lot of the early game plays, like Minefield in particular, line up pretty well against uh, the Paladin threats that are going to be thrown down that tend to be a little bit higher health uh, than attack most of the time. Uh, but for the most part, uh, I do think that Glory has got himself a nice game to start things off here, especially with first day of school into Hand of Adal. His game plan is very, very clear. And Fury Hunter's game plan, for that matter, on the other side, <laughs> keeping Blastmaster Boom, is also very clear. Yep, he gets the Corsair Cache as well. So both players operating at near ideal opening hands, it seems like. Hmm, interesting one drop choices for Glory. I don't really like the idea of the Dormant because it feels like his game plan was very much try to land Hand of a Doll as soon as possible. So Secret Keeper is where my head's at. <laughs> I love that he can look like he's the unluckiest person in the world when he's like, oh, I can only go one drop into Hand of a Doll. My life sucks. <laughs> I guess he is a little bit upset that this is a two health minion which dies to sword and board which fury hunter is running but honestly it's a one not drop the end of the world yeah it, they all okay, have okay. one or two health pretty much you're very lucky to get a three health oh come on derek haven't you gotten double aldor attendant off of your first day of school before i have much to learn <laughs> okay well this presents a conundrum for fury hunter to a certain extent where there is quite possibly a buff card landing on this Secret Keeper because Glory did 3-keep. Uh, but if he goes for Sword and Board, it kind of makes the mana a little bit less efficient. He could still potentially end up with Wrench Caliber on 4, but he is just going to stick to his guns. And we'll see if he has to pay the price for it later. Yeah, that was a bit of a weird one, wasn't it? Because given the fact that the only weapons in the deck are wrench calibers, it could have just as easily have been Corsair Cash on three. Obviously, you're potentially running into uh, mana inefficiency issues, but going for just sword and board on that turn was definitely something that I was interested in looking at, uh, even if it does mean you float a mana on turns two and three. Whereas now, if he wants to clear, which is, again, not necessarily a play that has to be made, you're looking at Sword and Board plus Shield Slam, which is a lot of value used up. What now? Feels pretty awful indeed. The alternative play being just Shield Block, help him cycle along. Um, I can see this happening more likely if he had a Brawl in hand, where he just kind of says, okay, at some point you're going to extend, so I'm not going to bother dealing with individual minions. But the problem is he doesn't have the Brawl or even a Minefield what at the moment. Now? So Shield Slam obviously is more tempting to keep when you have Shield Block, but it's going to be a long time before he gets to play that because he's very committed to holding on to Wrench Caliber. Okay, it looks like he is just going to go for a preemptive damage here and try to clear with Wrench Caliber next turn. I didn't even spot this line, but I quite like it. I think this is perfectly reasonable. It still has flexibility, even if Wrench Caliber, for whatever reason, is not the correct play on the following turn. He's got Shield Block, Shield Slam, in case something goes disastrously wrong. I'm not even sure what that could be, to be honest. Uh, but like you said, Wrench Caliber is pretty much set up as a guarantee on the following turn. And then at that point, Fury Hunter, honestly, is looking pretty good. As long as he doesn't get aggroed out of the game, Blastmaster can pretty much just solo a game if it comes down fully activated. And this presents a crossroads for Glory because he's very much aware of the wrench caliber and the fact that Fury Hunter has set up to deal with this buff Secret Keeper. He is still going to commit both buffs on this because it cheapens his Devout Pupil, I think, first and foremost. And he knows that he wants to get uh, the maximum minion presence as early as possible before Blastmaster Boom can come down. So I like the line from Glory, even though he's getting less card draw than average from Blessing of Wisdom. Hmm. I am interested in Devout Pupil just played out as soon as possible. It makes his next turn rather weak, but the Salhat can still be played with Crab, Crab Rider at worst. Yeah, it means it's taking a significant hit right now, obviously, but it, uh, it kind of just makes everything he does for the next few turns better, because even if the one and health minions that he draws are not necessarily what he wants to play, it just makes it more likely for him to find the other Devout Pupil, the uh, the Aldor Truth Seeker as well, whatever it may be for the mid-game, uh, that can juice up his uh, aggression a lot more. Yeah, I can definitely see the argument for that, but I'm not sure I'm going to hear any argument for anything but 
upgrade, upgrade, and swing into a 2 5 here. Oh, yeah. That sounds good to me. I mean, uh, Shield Slam is kind of interesting at this point because it does allow you to connect face, right, with an extra four damage. Uh, it's obviously very debatable what the extra face damage means, given that this is Paladin that has access to some pretty significant burst healing. But, you know, there was room for at least a little bit of debate, especially given that his armor is going to be very heavily eroded this turn. True. Problem for Glory is that the Salad's Pride was not I even touched this turn. And the Devout Pupil, I guess, still has um, quite an awkward shape to it, where Fury Hunter needs to Shield Slam currently to get rid of the Divine Shield. But he can start with Quartermaster, go from there. Cobalt Lackey would be pretty good. Is this definitely a Quartermaster rather than Hero Power Shield Slam Barov on this turn? Like, the Divine Shield is really annoying, but... This this yes. this is a lot of damage that he's tanking right now. He does need to do something yeah. about this. It's true. The health gets really scary at this point. Um, the way I see it is he's almost... Uh, whether he goes for Barov or the evil Quartermaster and gets Cobalt, he's going to tank at least four from this. Mm. Okay, he ends up going for the Barov instead with the Shield Slam. But I was going to make the argument for maybe you can get away with one more turn of Glory not necessarily killing off his Salad's Pride. But then again, my line would have still just given Fury Hunter a minion on the board. So this is minimizing the damage he takes. Indeed, and especially I think given that he wants to, as much as possible, guarantee that Blast Master Boom is his turn 7 play. Uh, I'm very happy with him just using the clear on this turn. Whatever glory develops on this turn, hopefully it's not too threatening. Uh, he can then just slam down Blastmaster and hope that that carries him to a win. Crab Rider Blessing. Uh, devout Pupil down to one mana, and he can fit in Hero Power. Yeah, it's just rather whether he'd rather fit in Penflinger rather than a 1-1, one -one, which... Uh, you know, when Brawl is a card, is something to consider, uh, at the very least. I probably do still prefer Hero Power uh, over the Pen Flinger, but something. Yeah, the consideration is between Brawl and Boom, I suppose. We can see the yeah. Boom, obviously, so more guys to soak up Boom bots is where my head is at. But it also just doesn't feel like the one damage from the Pen Flinger is helping Glory's clock whatsoever, so mm. just board presence is what I like. And I think really Devout Pupil was like the one thing that Fury Hunter did not want to see because it just makes it so difficult to even swing his weapon at all. Oh, is it worth delaying a boom? I don't know. I think so. I think this is too much because he would only be getting a two boom. Uh, like uh, four boom bots instead of six at this point, unless he swings, uh, which yeah. really that just looks way too scary to be swinging yeah. into a, a divine shield there. Yeah, given the crab rider also on board and the possibility yes. of hand of a doll coming down, it's probably too sus. So in the end, going to be going for this. He can fit in an evolve if he likes, but instead just going to go for silence, keep himself as healthy as possible for an upcoming boom turn. Yeah, this is exactly the line that I would have gone for. Uh, I think it's uh, very, very reserved, you know. Given the fact that he kept Blastmaster Boom in hand, it's very tempting to just say, right, this was my entire game plan from turn one. I don't want to deviate from it too heavily, but realizing that it, you have to be uh, adaptive in how you approach your game plans is the key to victory. Oh! Oh! Disaster! I mean... Kind of disaster. Is it? Yeah. Kind, kind of, of two mana, 12 damage on the next turn. Kind of. You're right. <laughs> I mean, for Glory, it certainly feels like disaster because yeah. this is Warrior. They have AoE, but this Warrior doesn't have <laughs> Risky Skipper. Uh, How about one of them? One of them is interesting because he can still play... Oh, sorry. The it's Overload 2, two. does it? Oh, yeah. my God. It's terrible. It's terrible, terrible. I mean, these are bad cards. Make no mistake. <laughs> Dust Devil has not been played once in Hearthstone's history. And Glory was absolutely banking on just going wide on the board this turn, right? Otherwise, the turn would have been Liadrian, even if it's not for that many buffs. It just gives him way more stats. And Dude, now the it. fact that he cannot play a one-drop without kind of nuking his next turn makes things extremely awkward. 
And I mean, just look at this for Fury Hunter. Great, I have a way to... He doesn't even have to swing the weapon into it now with the Shield Slam. Clear the board. Boom bots go brr. And then he uh, is looking in a great spot. And the bomb arrives right after it's got its job done from Blastmaster Voom. Glory has Librum of Hope, but not much of hope itself. So he can go Librum of Hope this turn. If he survives, if he if he can survive the next turn, he could just slam Lady Liadrin onto the board. Mm. And then get another Librum for the following turn, obviously, to heal up a further A. It's it's a scary plan, but it's the best I'm seeing right now. Yeah, that's where my head was at as well. The problem with this is the Blastmaster Boom is still going to be there after this turn. So I was yeah. considering something like Librum of Justice and Penflinger. At that point, though, you give up the Penflinger because there was no other spell to put it back in hand. I think Fury Hunter is fine to face tank this. Uh, yeah, very much so. I think that's why he, one of the main reasons that he kept the weapon, just because of a big taunt potentially on the next turn. Big ol' whelp. Yeah, big ol' whelp's looking real tasty here. Just drops that down this turn. <laughs> Another oh one. Oh my goodness. Glory needs... Barrel? Already played. Already played, so... The other Penflinger doesn't even get that much done here. Not enough spells. <laughs> Is this Dust Devil Rush to the rescue the best he's got? <laughs> Literally incapable of value trading. Uh-huh. I think he's just done. Yeah. Okay, he can survive on board, quote-unquote. It involves Librum of Justice and rushing the Penflinger, which feels awful. Technically alive, yep, you're not wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that point, can Fury Hunter... Oh no, he can't guarantee lethal. Even with Death being able to kill off his own boom bots, it's still not quite uh, a 100% chance of lethal, especially with that outcome. But it's getting closer and closer all the time. And the real uh, just nail in the coffin here for Glory is that he can't play Lady Liadrin to get back the Librum of Hope because he will just die as soon as he does that. Right, so his out now is to just straight up draw the other Librum of Hope and avoid the bombs. Which is feeling very, very unlikely. Okay, he gets at least a turn to play this one out. Uh, Crab Rider Liadrin, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Not always dead. <laughs> I've seen crazier things, Darok. Okay, not necessarily over yet. He's alive at one health. There's no Krastinov to buff the attack. Deathwing mm -hmm. cannot go face quite yet. This is not over. It's not. Deathwing, boom boom, hit face, and uh, is the average nine drop better than a 12, eight, uh, seven? I don't think so. It's don't probably just hero so, yeah. power. Yeah. And so if Glory dodges a bomb, he has Liver of Hope. Right, I mean, the, the problem is though that if he does that, Glory then would just have access to Blade Storm to be able to clear it off. I mean, I guess his own 8 8 would then die on the other side. Oh, okay. Whoa. I guess Fury Hunter did play the Lackey because he knows about Librum of Hope. So at the very least, it requires the swing. Right. But, so, oh my goodness. Blade Storm is not a clear at this point. But it clears the way for the weapon. Right. So it, the A take cannot connect face, obviously, but it's still enough to connect the weapon face down to five health again. Like, so much of his deck is bombs at this point. He should be dead on this turn. And even if it's not bombs, Glory is running dry on healing. I mean, he's played Liadrin and Librams of Hope, so... Whoa. 
He's oh. still alive! How? <laughs> Is this Dust Devil to the rescue with all of these... Oh my <laughs> god, surely not. Surely not, right? Surely not. But still, somehow, maybe? I mean, he's gonna play it this turn, right? I mean, you have to. You've yeah. You just have to kill them next turn. Okay, he's committing all of the Librams here, though. Oh my lord. Indeed. So he's going to have lethal next turn quite easily with the Wind Fury, unless something happens here for Fury Hunter. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, it's like... It's a win one, or a loss on this turn. He either one gets... One attack short of being able to get through the taunt and open the way for the weapon, which gives yeah. him one more break point, and also, crucially, a way to deal with the Dust Devil. <laughs> Tanking all this damage, giving all these Librams back. It's straight up for Fury, and he knows it. He has to get the bomb right here to oh win the gosh. series. Oh my gosh, it's come down to this. The bombs versus the Dust Devil. What is it going to be off the top for Glory, Librams of Wisdom? Delaying our outcome, but Fury Hunter's <laughs> reaction gives it away for us. There it is. Just <laughs> perfect lethal damage for Fury to break the round one curse. We show him on stream every time it feels like in round one. And finally, he's come out the victor. And what do you know? It's when he's playing one of the most generic lineups that we've ever seen him play with just Bomb Warrior, Liberum, Paladin, uh, and the uh, the Priest as well. But very well played in the end, I think, uh, throughout all uh, points of that game. Even so early as keeping the Blastmaster Boom, it feels like he is a player who after all these months, even years, it feels like, of Bomb Warrior being a deck, he knows it inside and out. That was such a grueling game. Uh, sorry. First round of Swiss series. I already oh, yes. feel like we've done so many complicated puzzles from the first few games. But what a story for Fury Hunter. Not only did he break his curse, he did it up against the current world champion. There's no better way of proving that you have what it takes to stand with the best of the best. I have high hopes for Fury Hunter for the rest of this Master Tour. But uh, it's not necessarily the last we'll be seeing of glory for this weekend because, again, um, you are allowed a little bit of leeway in Swiss, but of course losing early on is highly impactful for your tiebreakers. Very true. Uh, but I mean, it's worth mentioning, not only was that a 3-1 uh, victory for Fury Hunter, it was the Paladin going 0-3, I believe, for Glory after he won with oh. his Priest in the first game of the series. Definitely not what you want to see, uh, given that Paladin is one of those decks that is fairly susceptible. But for the most part, I think we can uh, chalk it up to, uh, you know, a couple of shaky plays towards the mid game. But for the most part, uh, really just not finding the draws that you need. While Fury Hunter got pretty much the dream Bomb Warrior draw there. It was weapons into Blastmaster Boom, there is very little that can uh, triumph over all that. And that does mean that Glory goes down to 0-1. It's not the end of him. If we 